Now, when we talk about feelings, that's hard because it's difficult to describe feelings for people because they're feelings. And it's like, what do you say? I'm happy. Eh, it doesn't really help that much. I'm sad. Okay. It's like, how do we help those? But, but and, and for guys, sometimes it's easier to think about feelings as how did I think rather than how did I feel. It seems to help sometimes. Um, but the, that emotional part, don't get hooked up on this idea that it's emotional. Remember how we talked about it's not an obvious appeal to emotion. Names are emotional. So just making sure that you add the names in, you're already starting to add emotion. We're not talking about it having to be like sobbing or teary-eyed or this or that. It's just, it's just having that slight emotional connection. So. These are some of the ways, different ways, that I would say could be moments of reflection. Um, obviously, how somebody felt, yourself or the client or the moment or you know, whatever it was, th or thought. Why is always an interesting element to be able to add in or think about if that is necessary to do that. And this is where it gets a little morals and, and lessons, but the second to the last one, describing people or locations. And this is where the brain kicks in. We've talked about memory, where the brain really does kick in. Um, our brains do not distinguish between a lived image or an imagined image. It makes no distinction. So if you describe a person or a location, what we do as a human is we fill in the rest of the gaps. The only place we can fill in those gaps from with information is our long-term memory. Everything in our long-term memory is real. It's happened to us. So we just fill in the, the different gaps. We do such a good job that we can almost feel as if we've been to the location or we've met the person. And if you think that sounds like, well, that's kind of crazy. Have you ever read a book and then gone and seen the movie? How was it? Not as good. Disappointing is the one I hear most of the time. It is, it's disappointing. Why is it disappointing? Because when you've read the book, you filled in the rest of the gaps and you've built a mental image of your own that you hold. When you go to see the movie, it's the director's interpretation of that image. And it's different. And so it robs you of your own image. So when you are in court, and we have such technical kind of possibilities in court now with images and, and all kinds of bits like this and being able to put up slides and this and, you know, and videos and all the rest of it, think seriously about when you want to use that. Because if you build a good image of, say, a crime scene, then every juror is building their own image in their head. And if they drew it, you'd have 12 different images, but it doesn't matter because they own them and they've decided how it is. And we're not talking about being artsy-fartsy about how you describe something. It's just, you'll just put a few details in enough to trigger them to start filling in the rest of the details. So it's not about being, a, you know, it's a master storyteller. Um, likewise with a person. If I said uh, the, the, he's a man six foot four with black hair, it's just a man with six foot four with black hair, but I've always said he was six foot four with black hair and he had a longish nose and a slightly hunched back. It changes. Or he had a glint in his eye that made me think he'd done something he'd regretted. It changes again. So it's little bits and you'll do it. So always think about those things. It's a, really, it's a great possibility. And again, I would say that that would be a reflection. Um, metaphors, they chatted a, bit, a little bit about metaphors yesterday. Absolutely, they're great ways to be able to kind of simplify what you're delivering to somebody when you're talking about complex legal kind of situations. Um, so all of these are possibilities and you just have to pop those in. And I'll start off by saying, ma'am, sir, I want you to do me a favor. You promise me that you're gonna be extremely honest. I'm asking you these questions. Oh yes, absolutely, 100%. I can be fair and impartial, yeah, yeah, yeah. What am I? I mean, you're the guy representing the guy who did it. No, no, no. That's not what I mean. I'm not a lawyer. I just want you to tell me, what am I? What's my race? 
That's when everybody gets tight. That's when it gets quiet. They start thinking back to that diversity seminar that happened last year when they were sweating bullets, fearful of giving the wrong answer. And of course, they all know deep down inside he's black, but he's trying to trick me somehow. What's the appropriate term now? Did it change in 2020? <laughs> right? I know it was black when I was in elementary school, and then, you know, then it was African American and people of color. What is it now? What is it now? And so you see them look to the judge for a little bit of guidance, like, well, um, you're black, I guess, right? Why do you say that? Well, you, and Lord knows, if I, dear God, one day, before my time on this earth is over, all I want is the ability to see the thought balloon, to see what they're really thinking. Because I know it, but I just want to see it like that graphic, because it's almost like, you know, on the iPhone, when someone's texting you and that little bubble comes up, and you're like, what, what? Don't know what it is, but you can just feel it. So I said, well, why do you think I'm black, and what is black to you? Oh, that's when they're really like, judge, that thing you said about hardship, yeah. Everyone in my family is dying of starvation right now. If I don't leave, my house will blow up. I have to get off. So I go, well, I mean, because you look black. And that's when you see some of the other whites like, damn. <laughs> she said it. We're thinking it, but she said it. What does it mean to look black? Well, I mean, your, your hair looks black. Like, man, this hair is pretty much straight, and there's nothing up here, so it makes you think I'm black. Why couldn't I be, for example, Hispanic? Okay, yep, yeah, that too. At this point now, she's going to say whatever. Maybe I'm from Uzbekistan. Absolutely, just stop questioning me. Just don't talk to me about it. But the reason that I start off by doing that is that it opens up a discussion, obviously, and you guys know about this, about bias, right? About what we think when it comes to the table, the issue of race. And then what I'll do that really freaks them out, especially in Orlando, let's go back to our example with the woman, and she goes, well, you're black. I said, where do you think I was raised? Um, I'm assuming here in Florida, since you live here. I said, well, guten Morgen. My name is James. Und ich komme aus Deutschland. Ich habe in Deutschland vor 25 Jahren geboren. Und ich bin nicht ein Amerikaner, ich bin ein Deutscher. Oh, shit. Then they really lose it. He's something. He's speaking another language that sounds like German. What's up? And so I'll say, well, how about if I told you that I am, like most blacks, a mixture. On my father's side, it's Native American. He was in the military. I was raised in Germany, and I spoke German before I spoke English. What would you think then? Some of the quotes that I've gotten, I think you were making that up. You don't look mixed. And I didn't know that there were black people in Germany. <laughs> but by this point, she's relaxed a little bit because what's happened? She hasn't been fired from her job. She hasn't been canceled. And we're starting to open up the discussion about race. So we need to avoid polarizing arguments. I think we all know this intuitively, right? But what does the science tell us? We, we 
Um, we can give polarizing arguments. We can use polarizing words. We can have polarizing attitudes. And we come to places like this, and we know we're among friends, and we're like, oh, yeah, cops are assholes, and they lie, and, uh, you know, and, and I got this guy, and I, I called that woman a slut, and, you know, and, like, all these, like, we make all these judgments, and we're among friends, right? But what do we really know? We, we can't just pump each other up, good job, you know, way to, way to embarrass that victim, right? Because the rest of the world doesn't like that, right? So we have to keep that in mind because we think, we really believe in our clients, right? And, and when we need to get our jurors to vote for us, and you know, there's an interesting saying, I don't need you to agree with me, I just need you to vote for me, right? And isn't that really what we want? at the end of the day, because they don't have to be at the pink end for us to win, right? So let's say we've got juror number one, who's right about here. And then we've got juror number two, who's over here. And we want to move juror number two just a little bit. So we go hard, right? He's innocent. He didn't do it. And that cop's a liar. And, you know, and, and we think that's going to do it, right? We're going to end up like this. And instead, we end up like this, right? All we needed to do was this. And you're not going to move people. What, what the studies tell us, what the experts tell us, is you're not going to move people very far from where they start. When they have intuitive notions about something, you're not going to change those. The best you can hope for is to budge them a little, right? So we hope we get the, the really polarized people out during jury selection. And then whoever's left, our goal Really, do we really need to even focus on what juror number one wants, on what they need to hear? We're not going to lose them, right? Juror number two is where we have to focus. And how do we do that? We do that by giving the benefit of the doubt to the witnesses that we think are asshole liars, right? So you want to talk about a cop, and you caught him in a lie, right? Or, or his police report, you, you exposed it. It's obvious he's lying, but you can't say that. So when we argue, we want to say things like, Officer Raymond, he took the stand and, and he told us things that really didn't make sense. And you know, I don't want to believe it, and I don't want to say it, and I don't want to think it because I'm a citizen of this county and I want my streets safe. But Officer Raymond owes us an explanation. Juror two might buy that argument, right? Officer, Officer Raymond's a fucking liar <laughs> isn't going to help us even though we know he is. So same thing with uh, arguing reasonable doubt. You've got these people that you're not going to move too far. And what we do, it's, it's our human nature. We do this, this thing called argue, counter argue, argue, counter argue. And the smarter your jurors are, the more you argue against a notion that they already hold, even if they hold it weakly, the stronger they're going to counter argue in their mind against you. Okay? But if you give them something that they can say, okay, fine, maybe. Then, then they might grab onto that. 